Welcome back to the Knights Book Club podcast. My name is Mason Knight. Sitting across me is my sister, Kylie Knight. Uh, hello. <laughs> this is uh, episode seven of the Knights Book Club here. Uh, you guys can tell we're in a little bit of a different setup. Uh, we finally got our green screen in. Uh, we're going to try to work with this, see how it works, Makaili. Uh, we're not going to be able to make a lot of eye contact with each other. It'll be a lot more this way because, I mean, hello, Makaili. How are you today? <laughs> Howdy. So we'll just talk like this. But uh, we are siblings. We grew up together. So it's going to be pretty easy to just look forward and talk. Uh, Makaili, this was your selection, uh, not just this week. Yeah. But this month. Uh, <laughs> so Makaili has completely taken the reins. She said, you know what? Uh, I'm tired of your terrible book selections, Mason. You bore me. It's a snooze fest. So you know what? I'm just going to throw a quadrilogy your way. But come to find out, it's actually a, uh, a five book series instead of four. So she just keeps laying them on me. She's like, okay, instead of a month, we're going to go five weeks of my books. Okay. To be fair, I thought it was just one book, but... Then I like looked it up to do the notes for this, and I found out that it was a four book series. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And then I finished the last book on Audible, and then the next one popped up, and I was like, oops. Yeah, and you're like, um, can I send you some money because uh, there are so many of these books, it's crazy. But uh, you know, we we are actually here today to talk about this uh, five book series. Uh, the first book is called Stillhouse Lake, and it's written by Rachel Kane. Uh, the date published was July 1st, 2017. And before we get into the author's background and stuff like that, um, I didn't know anything about these books. Had no idea. Uh, but this is a little teaser for the for when we get into the book. The prologue had me hooked immediately. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So, um, Mikhail, do you want to give a little bit about the author's background here? Yeah, she earned a bachelor's degree in accounting from Rouse College of Business at Texas Tech University in 1985, and she minored in music. Kane has written and published novels, as well as short stories since 1990. This is so cool. She was a professional musician who played with notable music musicians, including Henry Mac McKinney? Uh, Messini, yes. Messini, Peter Nero, and John Williams. Is that not the coolest thing ever? John Williams? Yeah. The John Williams? The John Williams. Incredible. Absolutely um, incredible. And, but this is really sad. In 2018, Kane was diagnosed with uh, soft tissue sarcoma. She passed away at the age of 58 on November 1st, 2020. Yeah, so, I, gotta be, I gotta be honest. Because, like, this was five books and stuff. And I, I, I've, I've uh, gotten through the first two books. And I was, like, kind of asking you about the author and I was really sad to hear that uh, she had passed away just you know about a year and a half two years yeah, ago. yeah it makes me really sad so rest in peace to her yeah that, that's that's really, really sad, sad. Uh, the page count for this book is 300 pages uh, the audible time is right around 10 hours uh, 10 hours and a few change or and some change I should say the genre for this is thriller suspense and also psychological fiction uh, yeah so Let's jump in to this synopsis. It is going to blow your freaking mind. It's a long dude. one because I couldn't just type the smallest. Okay, amount. so here it is. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. Gina Royal is the definition of average. A shy Midwestern housewife with a happy marriage and two adorable children. But when a car accident reveals her husband's secret life as a serial killer, she must remake herself as Gwen Proctor, the ultimate warrior mom. <laughs> With her ex now in prison, Gwen has finally found re refuge in a new home on remote Stillhouse Lake. Though still the target of stalkers and internet trolls who think she had something to do with her husband's crimes, Gwen dares to think her kids can finally grow up in peace. But just when she started to feel at ease with her new identity, a body turns up in the lake and threatening letters start arriving from all too familiar addresses. Gwen Proctor must keep friends close and enemies at bay to avoid being exposed or watch her kids fall victim to a killer who takes pleasure in tormenting her. One thing is certain, she's learned how to fight evil and she'll never stop. Was that necessary? That was a great synopsis. Did you write that? No, of oh, course okay. I didn't. Okay, well, it was great. I was really getting into that. 
I tell you. Uh, but doesn't that just bring no, you in? that's literally the synopsis yeah. from the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that, that synopsis really just brings you into it this is. story right away. And, uh, you know, I like to do my little funny voices and narration and stuff like that. But uh, I was very, very drawn into this book as soon as the prologue hit. Yeah, same. I mean, goodness gracious. So let's, let's kind of just jump into uh, the summary of this book, Mikhaili. What were your initial thoughts after reading this prologue? I was just in shock. Yeah. But, um, I mean, at the beginning, so there was a quote, I don't have it pulled, but it was when the police officer walked her in to the garage mm -hmm. yep. and she looked at the body and she just started screaming. I was like, Oh, she yeah. totally, she totally was involved. I was like, she's a good actress. So let's talk about the prologue. So, <laughs> okay. and again, guys, this is all spoiler. This is a book club. So we kind of have the expectations that you guys have read this book. So again, if you're new to the podcast, just remember that, uh, we, this is spoiler. We summarize the book. We give our thoughts, uh, on, on the crazy aspects of all the books that we, we go through. So if you have not read the books, uh, or if you don't care that you have not read the books, just be aware that this is a spoiler podcast. So the prologue, all right. <laughs> oh my goodness. So. Gwen is just this, this, or excuse me, at the time it wasn't Gwen. Uh, her name was actually Gina, but uh, Gina, you know, she's driving. She's that typical suburban mom's got two kids in her minivan. They're driving <laughs> home. Everything's tip top Magoo. Life is great. And they, they're driving up to their home and they notice a drunk driver has drawn through their garage, mm -hmm. their garage door, right? And the, the mom right away, Gina is startled. She doesn't know what's going on. And there are a ton of police officers around. There's obviously uh, medical vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks. <clears throat> and they go, are you Gina? And she's like, yeah, that's my home. And the cops are freaking out. They're, they're drawing the guns. They've got their, their hands on their guns. And they're like, get out of the car. You know, her children are, are freaking out. They're panicked. They don't know what's going mm -hmm. on. Gina doesn't know what's going on. And they take her out of the vehicle. And then she gets a peek into the garage. And it's this woman who's hanging there, obviously deceased. Mm -hmm. And flesh, as, as Gina often describes, is essentially falling off her body. Yeah. So she's been dead there and decaying for a while. And Gina is absolutely horrified, screaming at the top of her lungs uh, because not only did a drunk driver run through her, their garage, but uh, there's also a dead young woman hanging in their garage, yeah. which is, come to find out, her husband is a uh, serial killer who has killed many, many people, and they obviously arrest him, and that's where the book starts out. Yeah, so it said a few times that when the women were hanging from the ceiling, it wasn't with a rope. It was with like a metal thing. Yeah, like a metal. Uh, yeah, it's it's that they're kind of like, ropes, like but it's, yeah, it's even more creepy. Ugh, he's weird. And just a weird coincidence. So last night I get home from work, and my wife is is watching this like documentary, and then I look and I go, "Oh my goodness, John Wayne Gacy," and it's just eerie the similarities between the two. I mean. Like, John Wayne Gacy, a real-life serial killer, murdered 33 people and buried young men and buried them under his house. And it's like watching that documentary and then, like, listening to these books at work. I'm like, okay, this is, like, overkill. I need to, like, have a palate <laughs> cleanse and just, like, I don't know, maybe read the Bible or something. Because, yeah. like, it was just... It was a lot. It's a know? lot. It's I mean, a it gets lot. It, this book gets really, really dark, but but a, a well written and fun book. Uh, so anyway, so now we kind of jump forward in this story right away because that's the prologue, right? Mm -hmm. And we we realize now Gina has had to change not just her identity but also her children's identity because yep. there is a slew of of internet trolls of stalkers of people wanting to physically harm the family. They think Gwen's responsible. And then we kind of get into this story of how Gwen, um, which was Gina at the time guys. So we're going to keep going back and forth between the yeah. names, but Gina held held was held on trial. She had to go through this awful excruciating trial for a year. Uh, they were trying to convict her and say that she had helped her husband husband and was a accomplice to yep. all of these horrific murders that, uh, Melvin, uh, was doing in their garage. Eventually 
we come to find out through the story that she is acquitted, but they have to change their identities and they're constantly on the run. Yep. You know, their first home was, uh, was obviously uh, vandalized and the children are scared. And we really see the depths that Gina slash Gwen really goes through to protect her children. Because at this point, she's not even really thinking about herself. She's just be, because like, imagine having your life completely flipped on its head, right? So like you and I growing up, right? Like we had a relatively like, you know, we were family, five, five siblings and stuff. But if we just came home one day and Ken Dog would kill like 12 people, like it that would... would it would oh change God. like the course of your life. Like you would never be the same again. And Gina does know this. Gwen, Gina Gwen does know this. And she's just trying her best to give her kids some sort of normalcy. Mm -hmm. But she also knows on that same hand that she can never give those children normalcy because of the situation that their father had put the whole family yeah, in. Yeah, it's, it's like a, he just destroyed all of their lives. And, like, those kids have to grow up without their dad now, yep. knowing that their dad is a serial killer. Ugh. Well, not brooded everything, you know? I mean, even, like, their friends and stuff, they could never go back to school or anything. Uh, it, it was it was pretty sad. So let's move on a little bit, right, okay. to kind of the story. Do you have anything to add in that kind of first part of the book? No. Okay. You so, did it good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, so we kind of moved the story. Mm -hmm. Now the family resides in Stillhouse Lake. Yep. Which um, I might be wrong on this, but it wasn't this Tennessee. No. Where was it? Stillhouse Lake was somewhere in the south, but it was kind of off the beaten path, right? It and, might have been Tennessee. Yeah, I, it was some state like that. But uh, obviously, they're still on their own. They're still very isolated. But they meet this man, and this man's name is Sam. Cade, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and tell me a little bit about Sam Cade <laughs> um, from the first book. Oh, man. Uh, I'm pretty sure he he lives... So, Stillhouse Lake is, like, this big lake, and it has, like, little off-roads. He lives in a cabin. Mm -hmm. How far away was it? Because she can see um, his cabin from her doorstep. Right, and so he could also see her cabin. Yep. And what she found out too, which was very interesting, is that um, he only had a six month lease after yeah. starting to learn. And he said that from he was, wasn't, didn't he tell her that he was writing a book? He was writing a book, yes. But we don't know the context of what he was writing yep. in this book, right? <laughs> yeah. And I got to be honest, like, whenever, whenever you see someone, right? <laughs> like, when you're in this situation and someone's like, yeah, I'm writing a book, and you're like, well, what about nothing? That should be a red flag right away, right? Because yeah. you're like, what What kind of book is so secretive that you can't even give the premise mm -hmm. to? Well, and Gwen is very on guard about everything and everyone. So, of course, like when he was like, oh, I don't know, she was immediately suspicious. Yeah. And during this time where she meets Sam, she's also at a local gun range. Mm -hmm. And she meets Javier. Javier. Javier is a... Um, uh, isn't he, wasn't he a Marine? Yes, he was a Marine. Um, I was going to use a phrase, a BA, but I can't use that. Uh, but yeah. he is a, uh, very good, uh, soldier, you know, mm -hmm. a very good person. Uh, we come to find out that he also works, uh, as like a part-time, uh, police officer as well, a uh, former Marine. And he is the gun range instructor yep. who has been instructing Gwen. And, uh, I gotta be honest from the context of this book, Gwen's got a pretty good shot. <laughs> of course. I mean, goodness gracious. Head, body, head, body. I'm like, dang, to be able to rotate like that and hit your target, that's pretty impressive. She has to but be she on has guard. been she has been uh training quite a bit. She finally did get her concealed uh permit uh license as yep. well so that she was able to carry uh to protect her children better. But you really see the lengths that she goes. I mean, she's got an alarm system for her house. It's like They've a simply a safe, safe room. Doesn't yeah. is when she was like typing the code in, didn't it sound like a simply safe? Yeah, it kinda did, yeah. Yeah. But um, not so yeah, not sponsored. <laughs> no, no, not yet. Soon though, and go to book club of the month. No, <laughs> book of the month. <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty cool though. So Javier turns out uh, to be a reserve uh, deputy as well. So mm -hmm. we do kind of find out all of that. But let's let's talk about let's let's stick on Sam Cade. Let's kind of talk about his evolution in the book, right? So by happenstance, they run into each other, and Sam eventually agrees to help 
Gwen, uh, kind of fix up their house and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. do, uh, do all that kind of stuff and build a deck. revamping. And, you know, obviously Gina does not trust men at all anymore. Uh, and I, it's, it's past the point of sexism. I completely understand if my husband was a serial killer that you thought was a normal human being, you'd probably never trust the species yep. again, right? Or the gender again. Uh, so she has her, she has her, um, reservations about Sam, but she reluctantly agrees because she's starting to see this different side of Sam. But let's talk about the big reveal. Because he was, Sam was also in Air Force. Yes, he was, uh, he was in Air Force and uh, served for a long time because Gwen, when he gave her his full name, she obviously did a full background check on him because she's mm-hmm. very thorough. Yeah. Come to find out that he did serve. Uh, he served uh, a tour or two in Afghanistan, I believe. Yep. And uh, so, so you know, he had he had seen some things as well. Oh, we never brought up the um, the internet trolls. Yeah, go ahead. So basically, after um, Gwen was acquitted. She obviously got her kids back from her mom and stuff, and she started doing, what was it? What does she call it? Like creeper something. But she does it every morning and every night before bed. She goes online and she looks up like stuff, like people posting about her name or her kids' names or Melvin's names, and she sees that people are threatening her online and telling her that they're gonna like kill her kids and stuff and well, get. Yeah, so not to cut you off, I'm sorry, but no, this is it. where this is where for me it went a little over the top, okay? And I'll tell you why. Yes, do is it believable? It is believable, but got some of the horrific things they were describing, um like uh what's the word? Face swapping her children, okay? Who are completely innocent and in all of this. If you want to think Gwen conspired with her husband to kill all these people, it's still a horrific thing to think about and obviously those people are wrong. But then to face swap her children on like uh, pornographic material or uh, extreme abuse, I was like, goodness gracious, these people are psychotic yeah. on the internet. It was a little unbelievable at times because I'm like, man, I don't think in any scenario, like if we were to look at John John Wayne Gacy, just to bring it up, right? Mm-hmm. He married a woman and she had two children. You know, when John Wayne Gacy was arrested, people were like, yeah, let's kill the children. Burn yeah, them at the I stake. don't, you know, so I was like, this might be a little overkill for me, but I did understand like why, why the author kind of wrote it that way to kind of get a sense of this was a very high profile, extremely case. high profile, like one case. of the biggest ones. And this is also modern day. Yeah. So you, you know, we don't really have the same serial killers that we had in the seventies with John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Ed Kemper, all of their terrible, horrific crimes. It could have been different, you know, mm-hmm. if they were if serial social killers media in was more prominent. Yeah. It's just really hard for me to believe that people are that evil, especially when talking about completely innocent children. So who just I don't mean in this in like a bad way, but I don't think people would attack her kids, but I as much, but definitely her. Her. Oh yeah. Because for sure. you know, as they as it said all throughout these books, it's like, how did she not know that her husband was a serial yes. killer? But Something we didn't say when we first started this episode. She, her and her children were not allowed in the garage. In the garage. In the, in the yep. shop is what he called it because that was his area, his place to wind down. She he had a bolt lock too. Yeah, and she yeah. just accepted his space. And then later on, I think either in this book or the next one, she goes to explain like, I was living through hell and I didn't even know she it. She didn't even know, yeah, because... Because Gwen kind of talks about the psychology of herself, you know, and, and what who she was when she was Gina. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm going to make that comparison a lot. Because they're two, they're different, two people. different people. Well, they're the same person, yeah. but they're two different, like, personalities now because everything that Gina went through, she now becomes Gwen with her new identity. But she talks about Gina and how, you know, when she was Gina... All she wanted was that stable, secure life. She wanted a man. She was a hopeless romantic, is I guess is what you would call it. And when when uh, Mel kind of introduced, he proposed to her alone on the Ferris wheel so she couldn't escape. But she's mm-hmm. starting to see all these things that she never saw when her and Mel were together. So here's a quote really quick because we're talking about how they're two different people. It mm-hmm. says, Uh, Gina's long dead and I don't mourn her. I feel so distant that I wouldn't even recognize old me if I passed her on the street. I'm glad I have, 
I've escaped a hell I had hardly even recognized when I was burning in it. Glad that I've pulled my kids out too. Yeah. Who? Because she grew up very Catholic, Christian, whatever, very conservative. And then when she turned 18, she met this older man and he basically seduced her into a relationship. And Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I just had to read that because yeah. I was like, wow, they are two different people. It's so weird. So we kind of have to jump into this because we're going to try to keep our reviews. You and I, Mikaeli, what I've realized is you and I can talk, talk about talk, 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 <laughs> talk about books because uh, we just love it. Like this is like, honestly, Mikaeli, I love not to toot our own horns because obviously boop, that's boop. not the intention, <laughs> but I really do like, I love going through books with you. It's so yeah. much fun. So let's talk about Sam Cade a little bit. Let's just focus on his character arc since <laughs> we're him. assuming anyone who listens to this has gone through the full book. So obviously we learned obviously about Sam and all that kind of stuff. And then they kind of get into this like weird, awkward, romantic relationship. Mm-hmm. But then, but then when the first body shows up in the lake and it's killed the exact same way that Mel used to kill or not kill, but dispose of the bodies. Mm-hmm. Now, now things are hitting the fan, right? So now obviously the police officers are coming over to Gwen's house uh, and Gwen wants to go on the run because remember Javier was a guy who had the van and she was trying to buy the yep. van to try to escape because they've done this before so many times in their life. And they find the first body and Gwen, you know, Text Javier, hey, I'm, I gotta come over. I gotta get the van right away, you know, and come to. That's when we. It's revealed that Javier also works for the police department. Yeah. And the police department comes over and they go, hey, not a good look. You're trying to run. You know something. And not only that, but uh, your husband did this like twelve other times, <laughs> and now we're finding the body the exact same way. Things aren't adding up, Gwen or mm-hmm. Gina. Come here. Let, let, let's have a little discussion. You know. Uh, but Gina gets, or Gwen, I should say, gets taken to the police station and who walks by in handcuffs? Sam Cade. And it's revealed that Sam Cade, the last victim, the very same, un, very unfortunate, um, victim of Mel who was hanging in the garage when, um, who Gina saw, when Gina saw that was Sam Cade's sister. Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously we learn about Sam Cade and her sister of how they were in a foster care system. And yep. he at the time was serving his country and he was gone uh, serving his country, but they were communicating and finally kind of like revamping their yep. relationship as brother and sister and that she was going to go to a college and whatnot. And all of that was taken away from Sam Cade yep. because of Mel and what he did. And they often use this praying mantis is, is where Mel would like stalk his victims and then he would attack and then they'd just be gone, Uh, which is kind of creepy because if you know how praying mantises hunt, they're very beautiful bugs, but they're pretty vicious. Yeah. And they'll bite your head off. I mean, not you, but you know, if you're a bug. Um, (laughs) I'm not a bug. You're not a bug. No, that is good to know. I'm sitting right next to a praying mantis. I've got the green screen, so I'm going to turn you into a praying mantis. The whole podcast. (laughs) Just Just be sitting there like this. That's so stupid. Um, anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, it's revealed Sam Cade is the brother of uh, Mel's last victim. Yes. So now Gwen is like, oh, I should have never trusted him uh, because now it's like, oh, Sam was stalking them for sure. Yep. And that book that he was writing was a book about his sister's murder and the fact that Sam then revealed that he had every intention of showing up there and inflicting the same pain on Gwen slash Gina that Mel inflicted upon her yeah. sister. When we which found is that out, I was like, no, <laughs> Sam, no, I was rooting for you. Well, and, and, and it was funny because I got to be honest, and this is what's really good about the writing as far as this aspect uh, is I saw that coming for sure. Really? But what? Oh, yeah. As soon as like this <laughs> random guy and they're all giving you a little like nudges and hints, they're like, Hey, yeah, this guy Sam Cade, he lives right over here and he's helping out and uh his his uh he only signed a six month lease and it's almost up. I'm like, oh, hmm. No. Okay, this is a little fishy. All of these little things kind of It totally added up for flew me. over my head. Yeah. <laughs> However, why the writing's good is yes, I did see that coming, but then I didn't see the part coming where Sam Cade was actually like, Oh, but then, you know, I was hanging out with Gwen and realized that you weren't Mel. 
You yeah. had no idea. And all was, you were trying to do was protect your children like a, a really good mother would. Yeah. And for me, I was like, oh, wow. And what's crazy about the whole story is Sam starts helping Gwen. Yep. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is wild. Because he was the one, he offered to do her roof. Yeah. Like, he was like, I can do that. Mm-hmm. And then he built the deck out into the lake for the kids yep. and stuff. And, yeah. But we got to talk about this. So the second body appears. Right? Oh, yeah. The second body appears, and now now the police are like, okay, th- it's got to be Gwen. This is the only thing that makes sense, right? Like, where were you? What's going on? And um, it's it's kind of revealed that Gwen's not, and we're, we're kind of skipping through some of the more important things, but mm-hmm. it's revealed that obviously Gwen's not associated with this because Sam went over to their house, they're talking, and luckily, Gwen moves Sam Cade right out of the way, right in time as a shotgun blasts through the window. Yeah. And then, you know, they're calling the cops. Um, what What was the the female cop's name? I cannot remember her name for the Javier's life of me. Javier's girlfriend? The, yeah, the cop. She had the father that was walking oh. up the hill quite a bit. Uh, I know his name was Easy. Yeah. But I can't remember her but name. But anyway, the, the woman cop... Uh, I, I wish I wish we had a better uh, summary here, but uh, she shows up and now they're like, oh my gosh, they're panicking because Gwen's been gone for an hour. There was a call about a officer down, which was a fake call. Mm-hmm. And then they're all starting to realize, okay, an assassination attempt here, a fake uh, police officer down. Who's protecting my children? Yeah. Idiots. Idiots. I mean, I know they probably don't have a big police force there, but come on. Like, it's it's right there. You like, just, you should like, know. Take them down to the freaking, uh, to the cop shop. Yeah. You know? Yeah, do something. Don't leave them unattended. And uh, so they're panicking. They drive back to the house, and that's when it's revealed. Oh, her name's Kez. Kez, yes. And that's when it's revealed that uh, both her children are gone. What did you think about that, Mikaeli? What was your thoughts? Did you think the kids were going to die? Yeah. I mean, either that or get seriously maimed. Because at this point, at this point, did we know that there were more books? Or did we just think that this was the final? Um, yeah, when I started the first book, I just thought it was the first book. So I thought, the only book, I I thought one of her kids was going to die. Yeah, for sure. Or, and I thought probably, uh, and it's really weird because the boys have multiple names too. Or the boy and the girl have multiple names. But we just call them Connor and Lanny. Yeah. Because that's way easier than... It is. I can't remember their names. Their old names. Their old names, but their new names are Connor and uh, Atlanta, right? Yeah. Yeah, as like the city. But they call her Lanny for short. But anyway, they get kidnapped. And uh, at this point, I'm thinking, okay, this is not going to end well. Because you obviously know that there's a copycat killer. Because Mel's still in prison at this point. And we have to talk about that too. Gwen visited Mel. And yeah. that the description of Mel, he's literally the devil. He's the devil, the devil. in human skin, is yes. how they described it. And it's definitely the case. I mean, this man just enjoys tormenting, torturing, and killing people. And this is kind of where he's just we're demented. Yeah. And this is kind of where we're also introduced uh, to Absalom. We don't know what Absalom is. We just think it's a person at this point. Yeah, because Absalom is the one who gave her and her kids and all of them, like, uh, different locations and stuff. Different locations and false identities. Yep. Because she just is trying to get away from all of the the internet trolls. Wow. But we come to find out, too, that Absalom has been working with Melvin all along. So, like, Absalom's even bad, too, which is crazy. So, let's talk about the kidnapping, talk about how it's discovered. They find a second body as well Mm -hmm. in the lake, and now her children are abducted. So, now there's a giant search party, right? And mysteriously, old Javier just happens to go on a fishing trip. Mm, Javier. Yes. Is he the prime suspect? Because I sure thought he was the prime sub- suspect. I was like, hmm, that's nope. really fishy. I no pun knew. intended. No. <clears throat> Check this out. I wanted to text you so bad, but you didn't start the book when I did. I knew it wasn't Javier because back later, I'm going to read that one that starts with Lance Graham. Yeah. 
So it says, Lance Graham, a police officer who lives nearby, even seems untrustworthy. Untrustworthy. He returns Connor's phone to him one day. Uh, Graham claims his son found it on the bus, but Connor swears he didn't lose his phone. Gwen later learns that Graham's sons beat Connor up one day at school, yeah. but Connor never tells her because he did not want to have to move. To have to move again. So, now, again, because they're getting settled, they're mm-hmm. revamping the house and yep. stuff, and they're that finally was, finding solace. That was solace. really good writing because the entire time I kept thinking about. Connor got beat up. Connor got beat he up. De- yeah. But he's not talking about it. But I, I, the whole time I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Connor would tell his mom if Sam K beat him up and then was like, all right, kid, let's go take you home, right? Yeah, because so that's, how that's, yeah. that's how they first meet. That's how they first meet. Sam K, you know, obviously finds Connor on the deck. Mm-hmm. He's beat up and he's like, hey, kid, are like, you okay? You look a little disheveled. And so he takes him home. But... It was weird that Lance Graham showed up and said that his boys found his phone on the bus, but it was really subtle that I actually forgot about that part and didn't even think about Lance Graham, the uh, former really? police officer. No, oh. I didn't. Oh, I didn't. I knew because, oh, I just so, got vibes from. Yeah, weird the, vibes. Yeah. Yeah, and that Southern drawl and that mm-hmm. like really like the hospitality. Yeah. Yeah. So. Anyway. They're doing a search party and everything, and Gwen's kind of disheveled. She's, like, freaking out at this point, and Graham's like, well, hey, I'll go take you down. We'll just go look for your son during the search party, huh? Eh? Yeah, because she wanted to go to where Sam was. Yeah. Yep. And it's crazy because she gets in the car with Graham, and then slowly but surely there's these little signs that are telling her that, oh, my gosh, Graham is the guy who has killed these women. Signs. Yes, it's really tiny signs like lying to her about Sam, saying the radio broke as she's trying to text Sam. Oh, he just happens to, and then the phone breaks. Like just a lot of little things. This, she's panicking during this scene and the forest scene. I'm not even Your kidding. Your heart was racing. Yeah, my <laughs> heart accelerated because it's so well written. I literally felt like I was in the car with mm-hmm. them. When you felt like there was no escape for her either. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was so well written. I'm going to re-listen to these books. (laughs) They're so good. (laughs) So long story short, she's able to escape uh, through her quick thinking. You know, she takes a radio, smashes it in his head a couple times, kicks him in the groin. Doesn't she stab him with the pointy, like a stick outside? Yep. She also stabs him in the eye, which is She gets shot in the shoulder. She gets shot in the shoulder. uh, And then we find out... That Graham wasn't the only one. Oh, yeah. Her, I forgot about Graham's that. Graham's child holds her uh, by, with shotgun by, by the neck as she's trying to escape. He's like, I got her. Luckily, Gwen's fast. She's been through a, a, so much training. I mean, she could be a Navy SEAL at this point. Probably. And she uh, disarms him and says, run, boy. Because like he's like 13. She doesn't want to kill a he's, child. Yeah, he's just a little baby. But I mean, I would have shot him, if I'm being honest. But hey. Uh, Maybe in the foot. Well, you know what, dude? Like, if you're 14, you're killing people, you're probably gone. So, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, well, I mean, if you're trying to take someone's life, I mean, if life, you're brainwashed pretty... by your dad, like, yeah. you don't really have... I know. I'm half joking when I say Okay. I'm not... I'm just... I, you know, I'm not Depends a Depends on the moment. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, if it's him or me, and, like, I'm not the one initiating it, then hey. But, uh, so, anyway. Uh, Gwen is, is escaping. She's running through. And she gets... Graham, Mm -hmm. and she kills him. But what was crazy is Graham had night vision. But luckily, luckily for for Gwen, there was a lightning storm. And obviously you know that when heavy light hits uh, night vision, it it literally blinds you. And uh, she was able to kill Graham, which was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, But she's, she's pretty injured at this point. Oh, yeah. She goes up to the cabin. And at this point, Sam and the and Kev and all of them, or not Kev, what's her name? Kez. Kez. Kez, they all show up, and uh, the boy walks out, but he's got this big puffy coat on, right? And he's like, I didn't want to hurt anyone. My dad told me what to do, da, da, da. And they're like, okay, well, get out of the house, little kid, because this one's the younger sibling. Yeah, the little So he walks out. Yeah, he's like eight years old, which is crazy. He walks out of the house, and then the 14-year-old comes out with a shotgun and starts shooting. Yeah. And then the eight-year-old pulls out his gun, starts shooting. And then as soon as she turns, Kev, or I keep Kez, Kez. <laughs> Kevin, uh, Kez, 
pulls out her gun, says, drop the gun. Luckily for the eight-year-old boy, he drops the gun. The 14-year-old's a little bit more persistent. Yeah. Uh, but they end up being able to, you know, capture him. And it's found out in the in the cabin that somehow both kids are alive, but they will not talk about what happened in mm-hmm. this cabin. Yeah. And they don't even talk about it in the second book either, which is pretty crazy. Oh, I forgot. Graham, Lance Graham, he had the rug. The exact same rug. The exact same rug well, that... He, the whole thing was set up the same way as the kill room was oh, with Mel's garage. It, but just imagine that. Like, knowing mm. that that was the rug. in Because the uh, Lanny and Connor haven't seen any of the pictures or anything. Right. But they knew, like, that used to be the rug that they had in their hallway. And all yep. of a sudden, it just disappeared. Oh, that was such a good detail that she added that just, like, blew my mind. I was well, like, whoa. Just, just the psychological trauma and everything associated with this. I mean, you got to feel for these kids. Uh, it's a yeah. rough life, you know, getting kidnapped yeah. and, and, like, this guy, this crazy copycat killer who wants to do the same thing that Mel did, this Graham, mm-hmm. who's a police officer and everything. It's pretty wild. But, uh, you know, wants to kill the children the same way that... Mel would kill his victims. It's pretty uh, pretty alarming, pretty disgusting. Uh, but at the end, it's kind of a happy ending. They all kind of figure out, but then Mel calls her because Mel's been doing this. This man. And uh, he's like, it's not over, you stupid bee. Blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get the children. I'm going to, you know, do horrific things to you. You know, I'll mm-hmm. paraphrase. You guys know if you yeah. read the book. Uh, and that's kind of where the book ends, right? Oh, no. You Wait, didn't. What am I missing? Melvin broke out of El Dorado prison. Oh, that was the very, that was the epilogue. Yes. I, yeah. I See, I thought that was book two, but that's right. That's yeah. see, the very end of book one. So we come to find out that, of course, uh, you know, Mel being the savvy uh, serial killer, evil mastermind, escapes with like 17 other prisoners. They all escape out of El Dorado and like 75% of them are caught. But the other 25, and happens to be one of them is Mel, who has been successfully broken out of prison. And uh, at the very end of the book, that's when it is where Gwen swears to herself that no matter what, she will kill Mel. Yep. That's how the first book ends. Like, you go, girl! <laughs> <laughs> um, but per- still protect your children. <laughs> uh, before we end this, there is one quote. That made me blush like a schoolgirl. Oh, okay. It was so good. She was talking about uh, her and Sam Cade, and it says, We allow brushes of hands without flinching, smiles without uh, premeditation. It feels real. It feels solid. I finally begin to feel human again. Powerful. And I was like, oh, this poor lady. Like, yeah. somebody just love her. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's going to, you know, I don't know if you could even heal from all this no. craziness. And this is book one. I too. really don't think. I mean, goodness, book two even gets crazy. Well, not even crazier, but it kind of gets into Absalom a little bit more and kind of the network because that's one thing we need to touch up on real quick is that she finds out that Absalom is not even a person. It's an organization of all of these evil people and these people paying these really for, like... really sick people. Yeah, these people who, like, pay to watch, like, torture. Um, I hate to use the word, but torture pee uh, in torture killings and all this, like, terrible things that... They do like that is the described literal in the book. darkest and darkest of yeah. webs. Right, right. And uh, it's actually an organization and Mel, it was stringing them along the entire time, you know, with all the moving and whatnot. He knew everything they were doing. So that's so the crazy. end of book one. McKaylee, now we get into the review. Uh, we, we judge this on five stars between three topics, the narration, the story, and overall Let's start with the narration. How did the narration work for you? Because the narration in book one is a lot different than book two. We have multiple narrators in book two. Um, I would say I really like the narration. I would probably give it four stars. Um, are you looking up who narrated it so we can say their names? Oh, yes, I can. Absolutely. Um, um, anyway, yeah, I would give narration. It was narrated by Emily Sutton Smith. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'd give it like 4.5 stars. Yeah, I thought the narration was fine. Uh, One thing that I liked a lot about the way Emily Sutton Smith narrated this book was it wasn't like every time a guy talked, it was like 
this. I hate when female narrators like just make men sound really dumb. If they are dumb, that's fine. But like, that's not fine. every guy talks like this. <laughs> so like, she did a really good job like narrating from the perspective of different men and the children as well. I thought she did a really good job. Children can be really hard because, as a narrator, you have to find that fine line between child innocence but mm-hmm. not being whiny the entire time. Like, mom, I want to go do this, and it's like, oh my god, like this is unsufferable to listen to. But I thought she did a really good job balancing the children. Uh, obviously narrating for Sam and everything. So uh, for me, 4.5 or 5 stars. Like, And I'm pretty easy going with the narration. As yeah, long as you same. don't annoy me, you're going to get a very high ranking. So uh, I thought Emily Sutton Smith did a great job. Now let's talk about the story, Mikhaili. Uh For book one of this, of this uh, five-part series, what did you think about the story overall? Um, I loved it. I was intrigued the entire time. I just, like wanted to finish it so bad because I needed to know the ending. And I thought the way she wrote it was really great. Like it just sucked me in. So I'd give it like 4.5. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, For me, the story, you know, some of the things that I have talked about, I'll talk about it again. I thought some things were a little unbelievable as far as like the, uh, the internet trolls and like people like really being like taking it to extremes with, innocent children who obviously had nothing to do with the killings. I mean, at the time of the murders, these children were like 10 and seven. Like to even think that a child would be capable or like joining in on this in any capacity or had any responsibility for the horrific and evil acts of their father uh, was, was kind of despicable for me and kind of turned me off a little bit on that aspect. Uh, But overall, the story I thought was fun. I mean, I got through this book in like four, four and a half hours because I listened to like two, two and a half speed. And uh, it was a good quick listen, good read. Uh, So for me, I'm going to give this story, uh, I'm going to go four stars out of five. It's almost a 4.5, but I thought in a lot of aspects, it was just a little, a little much for me. However, having the perspective now of going through the second book, I see a little bit more of where the author was going with this and not mm-hmm. so much just focusing on Mel and the serial killer, but the, also this organization known as Absalom. So, yeah. um, but for me, I'm going to give it about four stars. Would I recommend this book to someone? Absolutely. If you like, if you like this genre of, of book, if you like kind of this thriller, mystery, um, psychological horror, you could even call it in a lot of ways. Yep. This is definitely a book I would recommend. And book two, you know, did a good job of kind of uh, moving the story along. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Overall, Mikhaili, what are you going to give this? Probably 4.5. Wow, you I really like I loved this. these yeah, books. I just started the last one this morning. Okay. Yeah, yeah for me, uh, overall, I'm going to give this a four stars. I uh, still would recommend it. Still think it's great. If if I give a book anywhere from four to five stars, it's always a recommendation for me. Once you start getting into murky waters or sure, uh, it starts, you know, if like I give a book 3.5 or three, it's kind of like, ah, eh, well, it depends if you enjoyed it or not. Mm-hmm. But I did enjoy this book quite a bit. So that is anything else? Nope. All right, well, that is our review for Still House Lake, book one of this five-part series, guys. If you guys like what you've seen here, please be sure to smash that like button, comment below, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell notification as we drop videos here every single week. Also, you guys can find our podcast anywhere in audio, well, our audio format. We're talking Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, yep. Google Play, uh uh, Amazon Music, FM Radio, iHeartRadio, literally anywhere you get your podcast, you guys can find us. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. My name is Mason Knight. That is Mikhaili Knight, and this is the Knight's Book Club. Bye. <laughs>